This is Where We Live. I'm John Dankowski. Conflict between the East and the West has been playing out for thousands of years since before the days of Alexander the Great. That's not likely to change either. Historically, the patterns of struggle remain remarkably consistent over the millennia as people fight for control over geographic areas that offer the best conditions in which to live. To misquote James Carville, it's the geography, stupid. So as Eastern migrants flood into Western Europe, ISIS turns westward and Russia teams up with Iran, what can we learn from our history of East-West conflict? Later, Connecticut Superior Court Judge John Blue shines a light on Connecticut's early attempts to solve the state's earliest courtroom dilemmas. His new book documents trials from the 17th century New Haven colony. It's an early American theocracy. You can join our conversation, 860-275-7266, 860-275-7266. Comment on our website, wnpr.org slash where we live, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Joining us by phone from Vermont today is Ted Danforth. He's a letterpress printer, a historian, and the author of The Eastern Question, A Geopolitical History in 108 Maps and Drawings. These are beautiful drawings that help to explain thousands of years of migration and conflict. Uh, Ted Danforth, welcome to our program. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. What prompted you to write this book? 9-11. Mm, what, why, why so? Because I had a printing shop in downtown Manhattan, um, very close to the World Trade Center. And uh, in October of 2001, Osama bin Laden made a comment and gave the reason why he attacked uh, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And, um, and because I had been studying the history of printing, which begins in the Renaissance, I suddenly understood what he was talking about. Mm. And it, that he was talking about it on a scale of time. It was, you know, much larger than one would think. And much larger than, than most of us ever grasped, not what happened in the last century or so, but um, talking about a history that, that goes back hundreds and, and really thousands of years. So it got you thinking about... Uh, about this history and how it, how it came to manifest itself right there in that day. Exactly. Mm. You got it. <laughs> well, so, so uh, l- let me ask you about the title of the book, The Eastern Question. What, to what does that refer? The Eastern Question was a diplomatic issue in the 19th century uh, between the West and Russia over what would happen to the Ottoman Empire when it finally collapsed and who would get it. And Russia is the beginning of the Russophobia that leads to in the Cold War. And uh, Russians were interested in controlling the access to the Straits of Constantinople and a warm water port for their fleet to get out from the Black Sea, which today is the reason for their support of um, Bashar al-Assad's government in Syria, because he controls the two ports of Latakia and Tartus, which is their only, and which they've just recently, in the last couple of days, been fortifying so that the history is it's the eastern question is still very much alive and with us and it basically ended up in world war one maybe you can describe for us i'm sure better than i can the, the style of the of the history book that you've written because as i say it's a series of drawings and as i was describing it to to betsy kaplan our producer beforehand i almost feel as though what you've done is taken some very central questions about how the world got to be where it is today, and you've taken a number of different snapshots or done, or done sketches of different questions within that, taking, taking a look at migration patterns, taking a look at uh, the people who live in certain places and the type of, of land that they inhabit. Maybe you can describe the, the style of the book and, and the way that you wanted to present this very, very long history. Well, the, the ideas presented themselves to me in a visual form in my, in my imagination. And so I began to make these drawings, and I wrote the text to go with the drawings. At first, I started writing a text, and I realized that if I got away from the drawing, I was, you know, got myself mired into too much complication because the drawings were able to express in very, with, with just a glance, you know, the idea. Um, but basically, as I worked through the material, I began to really look at see history as a um, as a play with um, six main characters who develop over time going from the you know ancient kingdoms and empires uh, 
to modern states and blocs, east and west. It's a drama, in the words of Polonius in Hamlet, a tragical, comical, historical, in the, in the sense that it's tragical that people do die, comical in the sense that people do live, and in the end they get married and have babies and life goes on, mm-hmm. and historical in the sense that um, it, it is true. It's the true story. It's the one really great story. And the plot is driven by, I see it as a, as a plot driven by dynamics of geopolitics, three dynamics, basically oscillations between the poles of desert and sown, east and west, and order and disorder, which we see manifested today in you know, current events, but that, that have been active in the historical process from its beginning, going back to the Babylonians and the Chaldeans and the Akkadians and the Persians. When you talk about desert and sown, uh, explain what you mean. Desert and sown is a classical, uh, a geopolitical expression, meaning the opposition between the people that are living in um, the settled areas, which was Mesopotamia when the people first settled in, you know, in the valley of Iraq, the well-watered land, as it means, in, as what that means in Arabic, and the people living outside who wanted to get in, the nomads, who were driven by poverty and, um, you know, and hunger to trying to get into the, into the Mesopotamian kingdoms. And, and they eventually would overthrow the orders there and establish a new order. And um, you see it active today, you know, all over the place in the world, when my, the, the vast migrations that are happening across the Mexican-American border or across the Mediterranean or coming through the Balkans uh, from Syria into Hungary. It's a, anyway, that's Desert Sun. What's interesting about that, though, too, is, is how it, it, it often, most often throughout history, plays into that other dynamic that you talk about, order and, and fragmentation or order and chaos, which is often these, these dry places which people are trying to flee to get to the fertile places. Those dry places often are the most disorderly, the places where there is chaos, and that seems to be very much the case in, in what's happening in, in people moving from Syria to Hungary and people moving from Mexico to the U.S. Exactly. So it's, what, it's completely tied up with the idea. This, the, it, it was it was a dynamic pointed out in the 14th century by the Arab historian Ibn Khaldun, who came from Tunisia, and he points out that how the that people that settle in in, in the cities become soft, and um, you know, and unable to defend themselves, where the nomads are living in the deserts are tough, hardy. Don't need anything, and they move in and they overthrow the orders in in the in the cities and reestablish new orders. But then, in them, in turn, they themselves become soft and prone to being overthrown by the next wave of nomads coming in. And in history, it's often been that the nomads have been to the to the west, to the east, and to the west were the settled cities. We're talking with the artist and historian Ted Danforth about his new book, The Eastern Question, A Geopolitical History in 108 Maps and Drawings. It tells the story of migration and conflict over not just the last couple hundred years, but a couple millennia, and it helps us understand a bit better how we are uh, how we are today. Let, let's take a look at some examples uh, of how these patterns that you write about work. For instance, how, how do you see Russia's annexation as Ukraine uh, being part of a process set in motion many, many millennia ago. Well, that the, Russia's annexation of Ukraine and Crimea is again a pattern of order and fragmentation. The Russian Ukraine and Crimea were were very much part of the Russian Empire, and as Pushkin says, cried, the Crimea was the cradle of Mein Onyegin, which is the first book of Russian literature, and um, in at the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in 1917, the Bolsheviks gave up Ukraine and all of Western Russia in order to save the revolution, and uh, were much lambasted for that by the Russian people. But um, but Stalin got it back in after the war, and then in recently, you know, under the it was called the Orange Revolution, Russia was forced to give up Ukraine and Crimea, and then Putin got them back again. 
and it's just the nat- natural, to me, the natural pattern of order and fragmentation. It, it's a it's a natural pattern. We often, from a, an American Western point of view, look at that conflict currently and Russia's interest in Ukraine as being the result of of one individual, Vladimir Putin, trying to to reclaim a Russia that that once was. Is that looking at it in some ways the right way or is that too short sighted a a way of of viewing Russia's intentions in in Ukraine? Oh, I think that's pretty clear. I mean, it's it's he was he's what he's and he's and he's finding that he can he can get the Russian people behind him by because the Russians are very patriotic. And they, when anyone that claimed, like Stalin, was able, even though he was hated for a long time, was able to channel into Russian patriotism and um, kept himself in power by doing it. I, I wonder, though, how much some of these things have changed over time as many false borders, boundaries that have just been drawn um, almost at random uh, went up around countries. Obviously, ethnicities are still very strong, but... Over the years, some of those ethnicities have have weakened because of the great globalization of of the world. I, I I wonder if this idea of of strong national identity is something that's that's quite a bit different than say this same region a few hundred years ago. Well, that's a good question. Um, could you say it again? <laughs> Well, I, do you think that the notions of of national identity have changed substantially, let's say, in the in the 20th and 21st century, given all of the small countries cut up with with false borders uh, can, compared to some of the large tracts of land that empires controlled uh, in in your book that you that you talk about thousands of years ago? Well, I think you're talking about the, the rise of nationalism yeah. in the 19th century, what we you know, romantic nationalism that was a rather, relatively new phenomenon um, that was counter, you know, empire, that, that people in living in the lands that were under the Aust- Austro-Hungarian Empire viewed it as an oppressive force and wanted to overthrow it and assert their Hungarian or Bohemian or Yugoslavian identities. And... Um, and that it's a part of that's part of the order, of the pattern of order and fragmentation. That you have a an empire asserting its control over large areas with, within which there are open borders, people moving, and in theory, an empire as lo- as long as it's tolerant can last for a very long time. When you talk about people moving over great uh, spaces. You mentioned earlier the, the migrants that we see coming from uh, places like Syria and Iraq now trying to get into Europe. A- as you see this pattern right now in our newspapers ev- every morning, um, w- what does that say to you, uh, having l- looked at this this long history? Is this very much in line with the migration patterns we've seen over time? Yeah, it is, certainly. Certainly. It's not so classic, the desert and some, because, of course, they're moving from a relatively settled area like Syria. I mean, after all, Assad was an ophthalmologist. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there, the people that are leaving there have had, had money, were professors and doctors and lawyers and, you know, engineers, and they're not, they're not desert nomads. But they've been forced into this pattern of, of migration because of essentially want, hunger, poverty, you know, oppression, and a civil war you know, a breakdown of civil order. Do, do you think that there is, uh, over the course of, of time, been a change in this desert and sown pattern, given, as you say, the fact that we're so easily able to settle desert places? I mean, the the history of, of refrigeration and, and air conditioning and easy building of roads is, is relatively, it's a relatively short history. Do you think that there's something about that pattern that's substantially changing, given the way that I don't know, Ted Danforth, people can, can live almost anywhere, even in, in the most in inhospitable Texas. conditions now. In Texas or in the American South. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> they, said that, they, they say that without air conditioning, you know, Texas and the American South would never have, could have never risen as a political or economic force. 
it, it, it is it is an interesting thing how how technology maybe changes some of these patterns, but the patterns that you uh, you point out in your book are are well established. And we're talking today with Ted Danforth. The Eastern Question is a book. It's a beautiful geopolitical history in 108 maps and drawings. When we come back, we'll be talking more about some of the patterns that he sees over history and what they might mean today, including with groups like ISIS. If you want to join our conversation, 860-275-7266. This is where we live. This is Where We Live. I'm John Dankosky. Today, a little bit of a history lesson on where we live. Coming up, Judge John Blue takes us back to the trials of the New Haven colonies of the 17th century. Some fascinating stuff there. We're also talking with Ted Danforth. He's a letterpress printer, a historian, and the author of The Eastern Question, A Geopolitical History in 108 Maps and Drawings. It helps us understand a little bit better about the world that we have today. We've been talking about patterns of migration and conflict, uh, Ted. I'm wondering about the patterns of behavior we see with a group like ISIS and how they may resemble some of the the groups similar to them in the past? I mean, historically, how should we place a group like ISIS from from your standpoint? Oh, ISIS is a classic Islamic rebel state. It's, in fact, the Ottoman Empire started as a classic Islamic rebel state. And uh, the Mahdi in in the Sudan was another example. I don't know if any of your um, listeners remember the movie um, Khartoum, where General Gordon, the British hero, was killed uh, fighting against the Mahdi. Um, and ISIS is, just fits perfectly into that pattern. ISIS talks uh, famously about wanting to establish a, a caliphate in, in this region, and of course, this is this is a notion that you that you grapple with in in your book as well. Can you maybe explain your 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 ideas of of the historical caliphate that that perhaps ISIS talks about getting back to right well the the word caliph in arabic means successor and the the first caliphs were you know you know um followed directly after muhammad's death and they were the ones that made the great huge enormous conquests of uh, you know, of the Byzantine Empire and the Western Roman Empire and of Persia. They led it to the, they're called the, the rightly guided caliphs. Um, and they were driven, you know, by the force of Arab poetry and this new religion that was um, a very highly poetic thing um, to come flying out of the deserts and of Arabia. It was one of the most astonishing conquests in, the whole, in, in all of world history, except perhaps the European, con- the Western European conquest of the world by ship um, is the only thing that compares to it. Is, is that history, the Western European conquest of the world by ship, is, is that the most transformative moment or the most transformative period that you see in, in all of these migration patterns? Because before that, it was all about moving over land. Right, exactly. Well, there's, uh, I see in the book there are three ways, you know, that nomads, you know, by definition move. And uh, there are three ways of moving over the surface of the earth or of the sea. And one is by, the first one was by horses. And it was actually, you were talking about uh, technology and invention. Well, the, the, the technology to be able to, to tame horses, to breed them, to rig them up with bridles and stirrups that allowed human beings to go into the desert lands uh, and find the minerals and resources there. And then camels helped them go into the desert and bring water for the horses that they could fight with and also to establish trade routes across the, uh, the vast steppes of Asia. I hadn't thought before reading your book about the enormous impact of camels on world history. Oh, absolutely. You could not. It, the, 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 just think of the Silk Road. That was, you know, caravans of thousands of camels, the moving cities with, you know, 500-pound loads on their backs were what linked the world. It was the first, basically the first uh, globalization of the world had seen. And the, and the camel also allows 
people to go into the desert, and it makes the desert, for instance, the Arabian desert, into a geopolitical fortress, where, and my definition of a geopolitical fortress is a place where, you know, you can hide out in, um, and you can come out from, and you can attack other people, but they can't come in and get you. Hmm. And the camel allowed, and the horse, the Arabs fought with horses, but the camel allowed the, them to carry water for their horses to fight on. And, this, and the same with ships. You know, the ships were the invention of the Western Europeans who lived on the shore of, well, first of all, along the Mediterranean Sea, but later um, on the shores of the very rough and, you know, scary Atlantic Ocean. Hmm. I, I'm wondering if we can, uh, before we run low on time, come back to uh, another uh, modern-day uh, story that we're, we're all grappling with right now. And how you think we might look at Iran's desire for a nuclear weapon, considering that the possession of advanced weaponry has always uh, helped to define a country as a, as a world power? Right. It makes, uh, the possession of a nuclear weapon is, you know, is, you, and to be a world power, you need to have a nuclear weapon. It's the same that it, it makes you a geopolitical fortress. You can't get somebody with a nuclear weapon. It was, you know, proven, you know, in recent years by... Well, the U.S. invented the, the, a nuclear weapon. The minute the U.S. had it, then Russia had to have it. The minute Russia had it, then China had to have it. The minute China had, to ha- you know, had it, then India had to have it. Then India had it. Then Pakistan had, had to have it. And without, without that, you are not a geopolitical fortress. And Iran sees itself as a, um, you know, as a world power. It's the first great world power. So there's a new wrinkle in that now because there's a professor at Johns Hopkins um, who claims that the U.S. that Iran is willing to give nuclear uh, to you know work out a deal because they just want to you know reestablish their trade and have money because they see the the nearer enemy being in Afghanistan and um, and ISIS and the, the the great Satan of the West is no longer the real fury, you know, the real enemy. I, I guess the last thing I want to ask you about has to do with something that perhaps, and we mentioned the ability of people to live places where they where they once couldn't live, and, and that certainly changing geopolitics in its way. But so much of what we talked about is essentially just a continuation of, of this history. People always want bigger, better weapons. People always want a geopolitical advantage. But... There is one note about the last part of the 20th century and the early part of this century that's that feels different, that um, young people around the world, whether it's Tahrir Square or whether it's in, in a cafe somewhere in Tehran, are able to communicate with people elsewhere and able to view what the world looks like, its styles, its its food, its its mores. Um in a way that they never could before. You, you were isolated in the place where, where you lived, and maybe you saw books or newspapers. Do you think, Ted Danforth, that, that the Internet and social media um, will transform this, that if uh, someone wrote a book like yours in a, in a hundred years, it would look remarkably different because of, of the technology that we have today? Well, that's a very good question. And, of course, you know, the world is very different with the invention of the Internet. Actually, we have a website <laughs> As, as uh, you know, our book is a book, but it ha- there's a website called theeasternquestion.com. And actually, we've been kind of enjoying playing with new technology. Mm-hmm. But certainly, absolutely, you're right to mention Tahir Square, or it's the power of, of new technology is tremendous. But I, and I guess I just wonder if, if some of the migration patterns, some of the things that you chronicle over these thousands of years would have been different if someone could have seen a picture of someone like them in New York City or in Los Angeles, uh, as opposed to only being able to to see what was right around them. Um, I don't quite get the point, but <laughs> try that again on me. <laughs> I'm sure it's interesting. <laughs> well, well, I 
it's it's something that probably I'll have to restate to you next time we, we talk because we, we run low on time. But I do want to thank you for the fascinating book and the interesting conversation. Ted Danforth, The Eastern Question, A Geopolitical History and 108 Maps and Drawings. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. I appreciate it. Well, John, I just might add that I'm giving a series of talks in Connecticut, where we live, um, coming up you know, in, in, uh, in October and November. And, and what we'll do is and, uh, we will get the list of those and we will put them on our website, wnpr.org slash where we live, so that you can find out more. Coming up next, the history of the trials of the New Haven colonies. That's next, Where We Live. This is Where We Live. I'm John Dankosky. So, was good wife fancy sexually harassed? What will happen to the bigamist's wife, and what will become of the drunken sailors? These are just a few of the dilemmas that brought Connecticut's early settlers to court in 17th century New Haven colony. While the law has evolved an awful lot from those early days, there's a lot we can learn from these vividly recorded tales. John Blue is judge of the Connecticut Superior Court and author of The Case of the Piglet's Paternity, Trials from the New Haven Colony, 1639 to 1663. He joins us in studio. And John Blue, welcome to the program. Happy to be here. First of all, how do we have these records? Tell us about just what you had to do to scour the archives to find these amazing legal records. First, it is amazing that the, we still have these records. It's kind of like the scene at the uh, end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, <laughs> where the Ark of the Covenant is um, placed into a government warehouse, which is what happened with these early records. The um, secretaries, as they called them, of the New Haven Colony, which was its own colony, not the Connecticut Colony, kept these wonderfully vivid records and essentially put them in a box uh, where they reposed for hundreds of years. In the 1850s, many of them were published by in a very limited form by the Connecticut State Library, but uh, not completely because uh, parts of them were deemed unfit for publication, which was a real clue that they might be fit for publication. (laughs) And I found these in a rare book library some years ago and became interested And the uh, Connecticut State Archivist was kind enough to give me photocopies of the manuscript records from the 1600s that were never printed. And I spent a lot of time learning to read those records. Maybe unfit for publication in part because there are some salacious tales in here indeed. And we'll get to some of them in, in just a moment. But first, for our listeners, maybe you can describe what the uh, New Haven colony was, who was there, and what the government structure was like, because I think that tells us an awful lot about the law in that time as well. Sure. Uh, The New Haven colony was founded as its own colony. This was not the Connecticut colony in 1638, and it was a theocracy. It was run by uh, people who had been religious dissidents in England, and uh, as we are taught in school about the pilgrims, they came to uh, this country or this these shores to worship God in their own ways. Uh, their own ways were extremely strict because the only law they recognized was the Bible. And essentially, the colony was run by a bunch of elders. There was no separation of church and state, uh, really, and there was certainly no uh, separation of powers. Uh, you had a council or a court, as they called, that could be passing laws in the morning and uh, deciding cases in the afternoon. And it was all the same people with the governor in charge. And he pretty much was of the same mind as the local minister, John Davenport. Uh, so uh, depending on your point of view, it was either a perfect or a horrifying theocracy. And the trials that would happen during this time were not in the great uh, English tradition of a trial by jury that has persisted to this day. We often didn't have juries uh, sitting on these trials at all, right? Well, when you say often, that's not true. Actually, most American colonies had kept the jury. The Connecticut colony, which was Hartford, kept the jury. But because the New Haven colony recognized only the Bible, my own theory is that uh, ordinary people were thought unfit to interpret the Bible. And it was a tightly knit uh, group of elders who knew what the Bible dictated and who uh, essentially ran things. Uh, So there were no um, uh, juries, and there were very few attorneys, and the attorneys that 
were there usually didn't do anything, and they may not even have been attorneys by our point of view. They could have been friends or helpers of some of some sort. So it was a very different uh, type of atmosphere than you would have in either a courtroom of today or a courtroom in Boston or in Hartford or in London in the 1600s. Yeah, as you write in the introduction, often the, the laws weren't written down, and, and you, you write here that uh, the 1656 laws are thus not intended to provide an exclusive codification of legal rules, while printed laws are to govern when applicable. When there is a want of law, then the word of God will fill in the gaps. That, I think, says it all as, as far as how the laws are written or not written for the t- people of the time. Sure. And one of the interesting things is the um, New Haven Colony uh, published what we sometimes call the Blue Laws, in, nothing to do with me, uh, in uh, 1656, which was a um, short book of statutes, but basically paid no attention to them. Uh, one of the fascinating, the colony lasted until 1665, and the court judgments just kept on referring to the Bible. Uh, so the laws were advisory only. Advisory only. So we're talking about this new book. It's called The Case of the Piglet's Paternity Trials from the New Haven Colony, 1639 to 1663. Judge John Blue, uh, who put together this fascinating series of stories, is with us here to talk about them. So let's get to some of these cases. And I suppose we should start with the one that gives the book its title, The Case of the Piglet's Paternity. This is perhaps one of these salacious stories that maybe are unfit for publication. Tell us the story, if you would. Sure. Uh, Well, this is the title uh, case, and it's certainly the most sensational uh, case uh, probably ever litigated in the entire (laughs) history of Connecticut, if not of North America, if not of the world. Uh, So in very brief form, in uh, 1642, a deformed piglet was born. And the deformed piglet, he was born dead, but it had a very interesting eye. Uh, It was a deformed eye, and people noticed that that eye looked very suspiciously like a uh, farm hand, local farmhand named George Spencer. And people put two and two together as to how that piglet had come into the world. Spencer denied any impropriety, but he was um, uh, locked up in the local stockade, which can't have been very pleasant. Uh, he was browbeaten by the local magistrates, including the governor and the minister of the church. Eventually, he confessed which I think we can now say with our perspective was the very first documented false confession in the history of North America. Most likely, yes. Um, He immediately took back the confession, but it was too late. He was tried, found to be the father of the piglet, based primarily on his own statements plus the supposed similarity of the piglet's eye to his eye, which is in the wonderful words of the records, uh, was as uh, like to the eye in the glass as to the eye in the face, uh, (laughs) which is what we in the law call circumstantial evidence. (laughs) So uh, the only law recognized was that of the Bible. And very unhappily for Mr. Spencer, there there is a verse in Leviticus uh, that says, uh, he who lieth with the beast must be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. And I'm very sorry to say that in 1642 in New Haven, uh, this terrible sentence was carried out as uh, a monument to the severity of the colony's laws, certainly, as well as the credulity of mankind. We'll be talking a bit about some of the things that we can actually learn about our current legal system through some of these stories. Is there a tale to be taken away from the case of the Piglet's paternity that we can utilize today? Or is this just such a an ancient, such an archaic, such an outlandish thing that we just throw it away as, well, that's the way they did it back in the 1600s in, uh, in colonial America? Well, I hope that that's true in part. Uh, But here's the way I look at it, which is a little bit more nuanced. One of the things that I talk about in the introduction, I talk about in some of these other cases where uh, these judges did pretty intelligent things, is that these were not stupid people. They shared the beliefs of the time, and the beliefs of the time led fairly intelligent people to do something pretty atrocious. I think if we're sober about ourselves, we'll realize that 400 years from now, 
We hope that we'll be praised for some of the things we do, but people will undoubtedly look back at some of the things we're doing now from the vantage point of another 400 years and say those people must have been out of their minds. Uh, That is the nature of uh, human progress, if you will, that all of us uh, who share in the belief system of the times uh, we'll hopefully do some intelligent things, but we'll probably do some appallingly stupid things. Uh, and it's uh, best not to get on our high horse uh, when we look at this. If you believed, which we do not, in uh, interspecies reproduction, the uh, circumstantial evidence of the resemblance of the eyes was perfectly reasonable. In my own professional lifetime before DNA, there were paternity cases in which a young child was held before the jury and say, doesn't that look like daddy over there? And in some cases, the resemblance was indeed pretty striking, and that was considered pretty good evidence. But uh, we've also got to be aware of the fact that our belief systems may sometimes lead us into injustice. So mm-hmm. I think that's a pretty good way of looking both at this tale and at the book. You know, in some cases in the book, justices did indeed put aside biblical law. I'm wondering if you can tell us the story about the bigamist's wife and, and why Perhaps it's something of a landmark in American judicial history. Sure. Uh, The bigamist wife is a 1661 case. So this is just when the colony is near its end point. And it's really interesting, not so remarkable from today's point of view, but must have been quite remarkable both from the 17th century point of view and the biblical point of view. Uh, Mary Andrews uh, had a husband. He had gone to sea eight or nine years ago. He had gone to Barbados. Uh, And he was believed to be living in Ireland. And uh, Miss Andrews heard through the grapevine uh, of sailors and and shippers that her husband had married another woman and was living in Ireland. And she came before the court and she wanted a divorce. And the court gave it to her, which is pretty remarkable because first, if the law is the Bible, you will remember that the Bible says what God has put together, let no man Put asunder. Uh, put asunder. And that's exactly uh, what the court did. And moreover, just from a strictly legal point of view, even today, if a couple was married and then one of the spouses goes and marries a second person, it is the second marriage that is void and not the first. Uh, the two would remain married, albeit unhappily. Uh, but the court realized either for perhaps moral reasons or for economic reasons, that this just wasn't right. For one thing, if she'd remained married to a man who wasn't supporting her, she probably would have been a ward of the colony, and they didn't want that. And uh, perhaps if you look at it from a modern point of view, uh, this was a marriage in barely name only. Uh, So the court did, from our point of view, uh, rather than regarding rather than depending on legalisms, uh, either English law legalisms or biblical legalisms, it did the right and humane thing in allowing Miss Andrews to uh, get a divorce and to possibly marry other people. In, in that way, we see it as a, as a more modern ruling, I suppose. Sure. And in, in more modern, you have to understand that first no-fault divorce just started basically uh, when I was in law school in 1970, in the early 1970s, and until the mid-1900s, it was just about impossible to get a divorce unless you were Henry VIII or uh, <laughs> there was something you know, that was really quite extraordinary. And this predated the uh, 19th century by um, a couple of hundred years. I mean, they were much – uh, one way to uh, think about this is that in 1661 – you're closer to Henry VIII than you are to the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> that is indeed one way to look at it. Tell us about the, the case of the disputed will. Here's, here's another one that I, I think maybe has some, some interesting modern resonances for us. Sure. Well, this is actually a case that I really like as a judge. And if I were to recommend that a neophyte judge read one case, it would be the disputed will case because it really involves a judge who actively engages with uh, a person appearing before him. Uh, So what had happened uh, was that um, a decedent, a man named James Hindes, had made a will, and the entire estate was left to his wife. Now, the problem was that he was survived by minor children, we think from maybe an earlier marriage. And the, the widow was about to marry another man, Uh which means that the minor children would have been without resources, 
and kind of like the bigamous wife, probably wards of the colony, and the wife would get everything. So uh, these people are brought before the court. And I've got to tell you that on the law of wills, then and now, unless you leave all your money to your cat or something like that, mm -hmm. pretty much you can leave your money to any person you want. Your spouse may have uh, 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 protection against being completely disinherited, but if you leave your money to your spouse, uh, your minor children are out in the cold then and now. But the court recognized that this wasn't right, and it really confronted in a very biblical way the widow, maybe she was the happy widow, uh, with the golden rule. And it said, how would you feel if your husband had left everything to the kids and nothing to you? And, of course, she had no good answer to that. And um, with that kind of question by the court— the parties eventually came to what we would call a settlement where she got something and the kids got something, which was surely the right kind of solution for that problem. But the lesson for judges, I think then and now, is to try to avoid confronting the litigants as kind of an Olympic god hurling lightning bolts and try to engage them and reason with them as best you can. Some people can't be reasoned with, but some people can. And the hope is that at least in many cases, people will do the right thing, which is what happened in the case of the disputed will. And that's what's so fascinating about this, too, is that the law prescribes so much to us and it gives us so many guidelines but we often do think, whether it's judges or uh, prosecutors, we think, my goodness, can't they just see that there's a human way to handle this that could be so much better? And I'm sure this comes into your courtrooms all the time. All this, the time. This question of the law says this, but can't we just, I don't know, work it out? And, and that's a story that goes all the way back 400 years. Can't we all get along, as can't, Rodney King Can't we said. all just get along? Well, here's a story about just getting along, and this is perhaps amusing, but it gets back to some of the questions about what was uh, okay and not okay to do or sell in, 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 the six, in the 1600s. The case of the drunken sailors. Can you tell us, tell us this one? All right. Uh, this is uh, one of my personal favorites. This is a 1648 case. And who knew that sailors could become intoxicated? Yeah, I've, uh, I've never must, heard such a thing. I, I'm sure that your listeners will be uh, quite shocked to learn. So uh, this involves both an epic brawl between the sailors of three different ships in New Haven Harbor and kind of an interesting question of law that's very analogous to the kinds of questions that judges at all levels, including the Supreme Court of the United States, have all the time. And that is what to do when a law seems to dictate a particular result that makes no sense. And I'm thinking, uh, for example, of the Obamacare case that was just before the Supreme Court of the United States, for example. But at any rate, in this case, there were sailors from three ships who got together in New Haven Colony, uh, and they decided to tie one on, uh, first time in nautical history, I'm sure. Uh, and they went to what was probably something like a speakeasy, uh, an unofficial bar run by a man named Bassett. Now, Bassett is kind of a cunning character, and he tells them that he has a three-court rule. Uh, that is that he can't serve a smaller quantity than three courts of whatever it is that he's serving, which was probably pretty strong. Probably. Well, the sailors said, no problem there. Uh, they drank the three courts, and then for good measure, they had another three courts. And, of course, by that time, they were in quite a state. Uh, one of the sailors calls another sailor, Brother Loggerhead. And at that point, the fists were flying. Now it's on. Now it's on. So they go out into the street, and there's this tremendous brawl. Uh, they're uh, punching each other's face. They're tearing out each other's eyes. They're rolling in the mud. And uh, they're generally acting as drunken sailors uh, might. Uh, so um, if, if you ever read From Here to Eternity by James Jones, uh, you'll recall some drunken brawls in there that this is kind of reminiscent of. So all these people are brought before the magistrates, except for the, the sailors of one ship who escape before the gendarmes can get them. And the drunken sailors are given kind of modest fines and, and sent out of town. But the interesting question is what to do with Bassett. He's, he's the saloon keeper because he wasn't a licensed saloon keeper. And uh, to uh, make a long story short, there was a local law 
that said that to prohibit drunkenness or to prevent drunkenness, you had to, if you were serving in quantities of two quarts or less, you have to have a license. Of course, the idea was probably to exempt wholesalers from it. But if you were serving in two quarts or one quart or pints or cups or whatever, you have to have a license. And that's why Bassett said, well, I've got to serve three quarts at a minimum. So the question was, had Bassett broken the law? Because if you looked at the law, he invoked this three-court rule, which was his invention, not not the uh, jurisdictions. And uh, he was absolutely right. He wasn't serving in these small quantities. But the whole point of the law is to prevent drunkenness. So uh, the court uh, saw right through this and gave him an extra heavy fine, and that was its resolution of what we would call a case of statutory construction. But I I talk in a commentary to this case that what I think a lot of people don't realize, although they should, is that judges all the time, from the lowest court to the highest in the land, are confronted – with statutes which, if they are read literally, just don't make sense and sometimes produce really incongruous results. Uh, The latest Obamacare case where the um, state exchanges had to be treated as federal exchanges or federal exchanges had to be treated as state exchanges in order to regularize uh, the uh, provision of medical care throughout the country uh, is a good example. If you read the law literally, it was pretty easy to follow, but it didn't make any sense. But we come across this all the time. We come across it in zoning cases. We come across it in civil cases. We come across it in criminal cases. And judges are paid to use their judgment, which is what the court did here. One thing that's so interesting, though, too, is, and and you mentioned earlier, the the blue laws of of some law, and, and in places like Connecticut, we We've we've grappled with some blue laws over the course of time. I think about my home state of Pennsylvania when I read this case. In Pennsylvania, you can't go to a local store and just buy a six-pack of beer. You have to go to a, a store with a certain license, and you can only buy beer in cases. And I'm sure that there's probably some really great reason why that law was written that way. But the end result is you end up with more beer than you might have wanted. Therefore, you might drink more. Therefore, there might be more bad consequences but it's never been taken off the books. And I guess I just wonder, after all these years, John Blue, why some of these things have persisted, because some of these cases make absolutely no sense whatsoever, but yet we still haven't changed the way we do things 400 years later. Well, that's because, uh, first, uh, whatever era we're in, we're run by human beings, and human beings are contradictory. (laughs) Whatever era we're in, Judges every day or certainly every year have to uh, face a choice between diligently following the legislature and using their own judgment and trying to maintain a balance between that and um, a perfect world is on the other side of the grave rather than ours. Uh, That is for sure. So I don't have the answers to any of these questions, but I hope that reading my book will educate your listeners that a lot of these problems are endemic in the human race, that human beings are complicated. But I also do appreciate that perspective that perhaps in 400 years, if we as humans are still here, one might look back at what we do today as not as modern, as not as thoughtful as perhaps we we consider it to be. And I think that that for a lot of people in the legal profession, but I just think for a lot of Americans, I think sure. that's a pretty good perspective, right? Oh, I think so. And I mean, remember, 400 years itself is just a blip in the history of the human race. Well, thank you so much, John Blue, judge of the Connecticut Superior Court, author of this book, The Case of the Piglet's Paternity Trials from the New Haven Colony from 1639 to 1663. Thank you so much, sir. It's been a pleasure to be here. Today's program was produced by Betsy Kaplan with help from Lydia Brown, Tucker Ives, and Josh Nalea. Our technical producer is Kyone Wolf, and our digital editor is Heather Brandon. The executive producer of Where We Live is Katie Talarski. Continue our conversation online at wnpr.org slash where we live. I'm John Dankosky, and this is Where We Live.